G'day everyone, welcome back to True Footy and this brand new show, The Football Come Down. A video where we unpack the recent round of football. We've now had a full round one, which means everyone's played a game. I'm going to give you my general thoughts as well as respond to some of your thoughts on this round. Generally the routine will be, I'll put up a post on YouTube once a week during the round and you come and give me your thoughts on the round that was. So we'll go through them game by game. I don't think it's necessary to necessarily break down absolutely every aspect of each game, but sort of my main takeaway. So we'll start with Carlton and Richmond and I did not expect this game to be as good as it turned out to be. And Richmond certainly exceeded my expectations. And first of all, even though they lost the game, I think they deserve a fair bit of credit for that performance, considering how undermanned they were. You know, the limitation I thought on Richmond this year was probably going to be an over-reliance on their star players. Yet they still had a number of injuries in this game. And yet, you know, the spirit that they played with under a new coach, Adam Uze, he must be pretty damn happy with where they're at, which might sound silly. I know some Richmond fans generally had high expectations this year, but I think to play with the spirit they did and we're in a great position to win the game, I think is a big tick, and I respect Richmond's performance in this game. Gibkiss did his ACL. That is awful. Like, the guy just missed an entire season last year. That's probably the biggest low light of this round for me. But Prestia did an injury as well, and I think one other that's kind of escaping me. I think uh, Tyler Young actually was. So to almost win the game against a Carlton side that, uh, you know, looks pretty damn good to start the season. I mean, they've just come off a win at the Gabba. Noah Bolter was probably my standout in this game. I think he had three goals, 20 odd possessions, played forward and back, played like a real lead. And Carlton just keep finding ways to get the job done. They did have 11 more inside 50s in this game, only one by five more points. So I suppose that would suggest there's some upside there. So it's not massively negative, although their forward line efficiency obviously was a little bit lacking. But I think Mackay has really returned to form. If they can get Mackay and Kerno to be a good one and two punch rather than just one firing and while the other's not, that makes them incredibly dangerous. I will point out that Charlie Kerno had an absolute howler in this game though. Not in terms of his performance, but his decision to play on in the goal square only to get immediately pinged holding the ball. That was really frustrating. But overall, Carlton just have this knack now. I think it's their last six wins have been under a goal. Now that leads to the question of, you know, is it sustainable? You know, I don't know if it's a, a big enough of a pattern for us to really bother analyzing that yet when you consider, you know, some of those were really quality opposition that they're playing. So it doesn't really matter that they're only just winning. You know, they beat Brisbane at the Gabba. They beat the Ds in a final. They beat the Swans. Overall, Carlton got the four points and that's ultimately all that matters. Now let's talk about Collingwood and Sydney. Now, this game was quite stunning in the nature of which Sydney dispatched Collingwood. There's a lot of talk about Premiership hangover at the moment. I mean, I think it's a little bit early, but can't gloss over the fact that Collingwood really don't look good at the moment. And in particular, there's been some damning footage of lethargic defensive running, etc. Sydney deserve a lot of credit, I think, for where they're at. Again, similar to the praise I just gave Richmond, they are undermanned in their midfield, but it bats deep and probably been undersold. You know, Chad Warner probably gets three votes in this game, three goals, 27 possessions. They've got Heaney running through there. James Rowbottom, fantastic. I think he laid 13 tackles in this game. So it wasn't just the midfielders that did well. I think Sydney in general were able to burn Collingwood on transition, which is not something that's happened a lot over the last few years. So mad respect to Sydney. They are a genuine contender at this rate. Essendon and Hawthorne, I thought this was quite an entertaining game. It was quite nice to see two teams do battle at the MCG in nice conditions. And I think the game lived up. I think Essendon in particular can be really happy with where this game went. Now, Hawthorne obviously are a rebuilding side. Or, you know, you could argue that they're coming out of the back end of a rebuild and they've got their injuries, but they played with spirit. And ultimately, I think Essendon can be pleased with that, but not just the fact that they won, but where the best performances came from. And I thought Archie Perkins had his best game at AFL level. And I did my analysis of Essendon's list over the offseason, if you remember, and I made the comment that they have a lot of young players that could go either way. Like they're, they're pre-prime, they could explode or they could not explode. And that will ultimately dictate how far Essendon go with this group. Perkins, I think, shapes is a really important player of that. And obviously they didn't have Darcy Paris in this game, but Zach Merritt played well as he always does. But Perkins, Sam Durham, Setterfield, Jack Caldwell, through the midfield, I thought that mix really worked. There's been a little bit of negative external sentiment given how Essendon finished the year last year, but I think there will be a sense of relief with how this game played out. They got a tough game next week against the Swans. It did come at the cost of Zach Reid, unfortunately, and that is going to be a positional problem for them. And another player like Gibkiss, who's had a bad run of luck. Uh, thankfully, I don't know how bad this one is. I think it's a hamstring concern, so hopefully not too severe. Certainly not as bad as an ACL. For the Hawks, again, I thought, you know, they were entertaining in this game. Jack Ginevan as well was probably a player that I've a little bit undersold. I do admit that. Two goals, 17 touches, played well up the field as well. Massimo D'Ambrosio, another one of their, you know, unheralded recruits, 30 touches. That's really positive. They will lose James Sicily, got suspended for a week. But overall, this game sort of played out how I expected. The Giants are North. I talked about this game being a potential belting by about 10 goals. Not because I don't respect North. It's just that I'm really hot on GWS. So I think for them to keep this to 39 points is a bit of a tick for North Melbourne. And there's certainly some green shoots there. One player I will highlight for the Giants. I mean, it's not a game where we probably learned he 
heaps about the Giants, but Jesse Hogan, I know Caden McDonald predicted him to win the common medal this year, and it's looking pretty damn good at the moment. He's got 10 goals from two games so far, currently leads the award, six goals in this game. Admittedly against a, a side renowned for not having the strongest key position defense set up in the league right now, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we saw the form we, he's displayed last year, particularly towards the back end. I think he's locked in to kick at least 50 goals this year, which would be a career best season for Jesse Hogan, so watch out for him. But I think this was a relatively honorable loss for North Melbourne. I, you know, they did start the year well last year, but I will know that they have 12 changes from their round one team that beat West Coast this time last year. 12 changes, that's crazy. Colby McKercher obviously coming in. Zane Dersman was another one. I won't name them all, but obviously a very new look North Melbourne side with a few key players injured as well. LDU was great. He had eight clearances. Tom Powell, 26 possessions and six clearances. They actually did beat GWS in this metric. So some green shoots there for North, absolutely. And I'm intrigued to see what sort of game they bring to Fremantle at Marble Stadium. It will be a tough test. Fremantle obviously played well this weekend. Geelong versus St Kilda was kind of a battle between two sides that I think were both undersold criminally this offseason, generally by the AFL media. Everyone's expecting Geelong to drop off. No one really wants to give St Kilda credit for some reason. But I did get this tip correct. I thought Geelong would be a little bit too tricky for the Saints to beat at GMHBA. And for me, it's kind of been a case of I'm going to only believe Geelong are bad once they prove it to me. And they did get a number of goals in front. St Kilda had a late charge, cut the margin to eight points, but ultimately, Cat's just slightly too good with Patrick Dangerfield. Probably the best on ground, I thought. Eight clearances, kicked the winning goal. And we saw like incremental improvement down at Tanner Braun. I think that's just about his 50th game. Uh, Max Holmes as well. And interestingly, St Kilda actually kept Geelong to just their sixth goalless quarter in 403 quarters under Chris Scott. So that, I guess, has to count as something. I don't think the Saints were bad in this game. I think they did struggle to get the ball inside 50. They're really inefficient with their entries last year. In this game, they were actually kind of efficient in their forward 50. They just didn't get the ball inside 50 enough. But Darcy Wilson kicked a couple of goals. This kid already looks like he belongs at AFL level, which is no real shock. And Ollie Dempsey... Might, might just jag the NAB Rising Star nomination. I honestly think between McKercher and Dempsey, those are the two clear choices this weekend. Gold Coast then beat Adelaide. It was a mad comeback by Adelaide, actually. This game was, you know, looking like a belting halfway through the third quarter, I think. What did the margin get out to, like, high 30s, nearly 40, and Adelaide came back massively in the last quarter to lose by just the six points. But I do think that maybe that comeback kind of papered over the cracks that I, I really don't think Adelaide played well in this game, and I'm sure their fans would be the first to admit that. Gold Coast midfield was quite dominant in this game. I mean, Matthew Rowell is one of the most dominant clearance mids in the game right now when he hit 20 in a game last week, and then he backed it up with, uh, I think, nine this week. Miller also had 10 clearances. Sam Flanders had 35 touches. Noah Anderson had 35 as well. So the midfielders really got them going in this game. For the Crows, it was a bit of a sleepy start to this game. They came hard at the end. I did predict that the Suns would be a tricky customer to play early this year. Also, the conditions kind of favor the Suns in that sort of sloppy, wet conditions as well. I mean, it's quite humid up in the Gold Coast. Not taking any credit from them. Obviously, Gold Coast have had a great start to the year. I just think Adelaide will be able to overcome what is a disappointing result on paper. But, you know, shout out to Josh Rotelli kicking three goals in this game. Isaac Rankin, two as well. They'll be okay, although it is still a bit of a bitter result. Then the Sunday game kicked off. Melbourne getting the job done over the Western Bulldogs by 45 points. This game seemed to be a little bit closer than that for most of it. And Melbourne really put him to the sword in the last quarter. And a lot of the senior players were the, the regular contributors. Max Gorn was definitely the winner out of him in English. And then Clayton Oliver comes in, 35 touches. I will say it is really quite nice to see the support for Clayton Oliver, as you'd expect for fans to do. But obviously there's been a bit of a swirl about where he's at and seeing the crowd get around him and cheer his return, I think that will do wonders for his morale. But outside of that, I think Melbourne's forward line, which has been previously described as dysfunctional, fired in this game, you know, putting up 109 points, that's pretty solid evidence of that. And I think uh, Kate Chandler was probably one of their best. And, and actually one player that I haven't seen talked about a lot after this game was Jack Billings, you know, new recruits, talked about as potentially being quite impactful. I don't think he was great in his first game and put up something like 140 fantasy points in this game as well. So some really good positive signs. As for the Bulldogs, again, you know, Libra and Bond led the way in the midfield. I was quite surprised to see Riley Sanders subbed out of this game. I can only assume they're managing his minutes. But Beveridge is obviously not too shy to mix things up from the selection point of view, which is interesting. Obviously, we didn't see Jack McRae. Caleb Daniel also picked as the sub in this game. They'll be disappointed with this result, but it is a long season. And Melbourne, you know, other than faltering last week against a Sydney side that's turned out to be pretty good in the first fortnight, there's no reason to believe they can't be in that top four mix. So losing this game in the way they did for the Bulldogs, I don't know if I really learned too much. 
but they probably do still want to improve, definitely. Port Adelaide took on West Coast at Adelaide Oval, the blockbuster of all blockbusters. Um, this game, again, played out pretty much how you'd expect it. Rosie and Butters, dominant midfielders, beat up on probably the worst midfield in the comp. I thought they were uh, really good, but I actually think it wasn't even so much the midfield battle where Port Adelaide got on top here. I think it was actually the transition. So the stats will say in contested possessions, clearances, it was actually fairly even. It was very much when Port Adelaide went end to end and really burnt West Coast through the corridor for Pat of this game where they really got on top and Charlie Dixon definitely got the better of Tom Barras. Ivan Soldo also was pretty impactful as a ruckman. I think that's going to prove to be a great recruitment. And ultimately, Port Adelaide being at least 50 points better in this game is to be expected. A lot of negative sentiment uh, from the Port fans about not winning by more. I just think that's probably a bit of a stretch in my opinion. I don't think Port were so dominant that 50 points is shy. A lot will get said of, you know, the fact that they had 24 behinds, but to be fair, I, I don't really think I remember them missing too many gimmies. I think they just had a lot of shots on goal from half chances. But they'll say that game is a bit of a tune-up you know playing the west coast at home is one of the easiest fixtures in the game right now so i don't think port adelaide have too much to be concerned about there i i do have an eagles channel guys for anyone unaware so i will give you my in-depth thoughts on west coast specifically in a video on true eagle which might already be out by now and then Fremantle made a big statement in the final game of the round, beating Brisbane by 23 points. It was an interesting sort of game. I think it was it Brisbane kicked the first three or four goals of this game. And even when Fremantle started crawling it back, Brisbane was still winning a lot of key metrics. But watching the game, it felt very much like Fremantle was on top. By three quarter time, Fremantle had actually kicked 11 of the previous 12 goals. So very, very good performance from them. You know, I, I never really thought that there were not a chance to win this game. I, th I did hit Brisbane, but I felt like it was going to be close either way. I didn't really envisage Brisbane smacking Fremantle, but Fremantle did still impress me. And Caleb Sarong, tell you what, this is probably the performance of the round. 46 disposals, 10 clearances. I think that's the most touches a Fremantle player has ever had in a game. And I thought Young and Fife really came in and supported him in the midfield quite well. Elephant in the room, Lockie Neal misses. Brisbane look a little bit listless in the clearances. I think it was 22 to 13 and they lost a contested possession count, which is a little bit unusual for the Brisbane Lions. So they're going to need to find a bit of an answer to that. They can't show too much of a reliance on Lockie Neal. But Fremantle were very good. You know, Jackson, I thought was quite good. Jai Ames kicked four goals as well. Did come at the cost. I think Brennan Cox picked up a hamstring injury. At Warner got that awful head knock and Oscar McDonald, I think, has a knee concern, but I don't know the extent of that. So that's one to watch for them. The thing is with Fremantle here, like it's not shocking in the sense that that we've kind of come to expect Fremantle to play well against good teams. That part doesn't shock me, so it'll be interesting to see to what extent can they keep up this momentum. I think that's a reasonable take. Cool, so now it's time to rattle through your comments on the weekend that was. So we've got Rumham, who says, as of Saturday night, West Coast have less losses than the Pies. Oh, that's very true. <laughs> West Coast must be higher than Collingwood on the... Oh, never mind. Don't worry about it. Mental XO says the premiership hangover continues to be a real thing. Again, it is early. I think this is the first time we've ever seen both grand finalists start a season 0-2. And there's no doubt Collingwood haven't come out with the right intensity. For all this talk about, you know, back to work and how th this team was going to be different... They've made a really poor start, but it is only two games. And, you know, I think back to the Richmond era, and I want to say even Hawthorne, where both teams proved to be the best team in the competition by the end of the year, but didn't necessarily start the season well. So I'm not going to read too much into it. I'm not going to necessarily buy into the hangover talk, but they don't look great. Talking Everything AFL says the Crows CBA has a high portion of Laird, Crouch, and Dawson. Yeah, that's quite interesting. And obviously Gold Coast midfielders, Probably got the better of them in this game. I uh, was interested to see what would happen with Matt Crouch this year. Obviously, he's played pretty well last year, but is an on-ball division of Crouch and Laird involved in the same mix? Is that a little bit slow? We've seen, you know, Rochelle and Rankin rotate through there, and I think that will continue, but I don't know if either will be full-time midfielders ever. Worthy says, Jesse Hogan and Harry Mackay in all-Australian form. Yeah, I think it's possible. Without looking at in-depth stats, I think those are probably the two key forwards you'd pick if you picked an All-Australian team right now. Bearing in mind, half the league has only played one game. Steph says, Guinea will be recruited this season. He did play well. He played well. And I will put my hand up and say I probably undersold him a little bit, to be fair. But I also think there's some other good contenders for that. Like I said, Ivan Solder could prove to be that. Even Todd Goldstein for Essendon. In terms of cost to what they've gotten, obviously Ginevan too, but those two as well come to mind. Ubra says the two Sydney teams will be up there. Yes, well, I predicted a Sydney GWS Grand Final and early days, that's not looking horrific. So... I'll take what I can get. Ground up footy says the Pies are the first team to lose two games by round one. True. That uh, that might always be a record. <laughs> when asked what his takeaways were for round one, Mark P says fish and chips Friday night and Chinese last night. Yeah, right. That's, that's a lot of takeaway, Mark. The history of Apple says picking Zach Reed in fantasy was a bad idea. Yeah, a little bit unlucky. I, I mean, I originally had Reed in there at one point. I had uh, Gibkiss as well. Thankfully, I swapped them both out. 
But uh, I just want to see those guys get fit. Skipper FC says, Carlton are prepared to win close games. The third quarter blues are gone. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we saw this come into effect late last season. They beat Collingwood, they beat Melbourne, they beat Sydney. So there is a proven ability there to win close games. And I do think that really adds some legitimacy to them. You know, if they were winning every single game by narrow margins, that's where I do think the sustainability thing comes into it. Purely because like, on a game-by-game -game basis, it indicates they're not much better than their opponent, but they are beating quality teams. And while Richmond not, might not have a high ranking, I thought it was a fairly good game of football and a strong performance. Boomer Star 29 says, Elite kicking sides GWS and Sydney will pick Collingwood apart. Yeah, you do tend to wonder as well. I mean, some of the footage has been dam damning a little bit about some players not working really hard defensively at the moment, so it could be that. Or you do wonder, is there, is there a tactical innovation here? You know, every year the Premier gets hunted. Have the Sydney teams just worked out how to play them? Who knows? Ben Akers has put Port bottom four and then put, I hate my team. I can only assume this is some sort of reaction to not beating West Coast by enough. As it currently stands, I think the idea that teams are just going to beat West Coast by 100 points every game is silly. I know I'm a fan, but I think it's silly. For the record, it's actually a bigger margin than what Port beat West Coast by last year. LD Sports says Chad Warner's the GOAT. Yes, I probably think that he deserved the three votes in that game as good as Heaney was it was a very strong performance you know in my head I thought that Warner didn't have a great year last year but I think he got like 16 brown low votes so maybe I'm just dreaming there Wertie then says feel like you undersold danger a little bit in your preseason content when talking about Geelong's midfield the man is still one of the best players in the comp on his day yeah so to explain maybe why I did that in my head I take your point 100% I was trying to pick out you know Geelong's midfield mix and I think I kind of based it too much on the fact that danger is, was probably going to play a bit more forward. Now, I know that that's not the case, but I think in my head, I just automatically categorized Dangerfield as more of a forward midfielder, when in reality, he does play a lot of midfield and is still obviously a very good player. Now, I do think with Guthrie out of the team, it's going to be a little bit of an issue. The, it places a bit of pressure on Braun and Holmes, but both of those guys are two players who could genuinely improve this year. So I think your comment is fair. Uh, again, uh, it's obviously not that I don't rate Dangerfield. It was probably just organizing their midfield incorrectly in my head. Anyway, guys, those are all my thoughts on the round one. Let me know in the comments any other thoughts that you want to add to this conversation. Look out for just the tips. Should be out tomorrow by the time you watch this. If you want to see my Eagles review on the Eagles channel, go to True Eagle. But for now, I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.